talked about ingredient labels before, but they can really be confusing. There are deceptive marketing tactics. It can be really difficult just to read the ingredient label and understand that terminology. In fact, did you know that when we say the word chicken, we think of chicken like you find at the grocery store? But AFCO, who is the American Association of Feed Control Officials, who is the regulatory body for that is providing regulation that the states all basically all adopt for pet food or pet feed, has different definitions for the same words that we use, but they define them differently. Not only that, but if you want to know what those definitions are, you have to buy their little dictionary to find out. Well, that's just one example of how difficult it can be for the average consumer to understand how to read a pet food label. And while we have talked about this in the past on Pet Health Junkies, Pam, Janet, and myself invited a very special guest today to continue that conversation. And I know we're going to have to continue, keep continuing this conversation because it is such a huge topic. It's, it's, it's a big mountain to climb, but that's why we're here, to continue to help you understand and learn and grow and do better for your pets. So who is our very special guest today on Pet Health Junkies? Oh my goodness, I'm so excited because it is none other than the Vice President of Nutrition and Communication at Green Juju, Billy Hookman himself. And he, we're, we're just gonna, we're gonna throw some questions at him. Um, he was not prepared for, but he always has an incredible answer for. And we were just so thrilled to bring him on Pet Health Junkies to help educate you pet parents today. And while this particular podcast is in no way sponsored um, or advertised, advertisement for any brand, including Green Juju. I know for myself, Pam and Janet, we wholeheartedly um, support the mission of Green Juju, love and feed their food to our own pets and could not recommend them more. So with that, let's just get, you're tired of hearing from me. I know you want to hear from Billy. So let's get in to today's episode with Billy Hookman from Green Juju, where we continue to break down and understand pet food labels and ingredients specifically in today's episode. As a pet parent, you face more challenges with your dogs and cats today than ever before in history. What's the best food to feed? How do I prevent illness and help them live longer? Maybe you currently have a pet living with disease or behavioral issues and you need a different approach for success. Welcome to the Pet Health Junkies podcast. We're so happy you're here. Pam Roussel is a holistic health practitioner specializing in holistic health for animals. Janet Cesarini is a healthy pet store owner and advocate for health through nutrition. Jessica Fisher is a pet parent coach and positive reinforcement dog trainer. Join us as we share our stories, experiences, and all that we've learned to change the way we think about raising our pets. We're breaking it all down and making it simple by sharing how we help pet parents just like you every day because when we know better we can do better thank you billy for joining us today we are so excited to have you well thank you for having me i uh two of you at least at this moment um so i'm happy to be here and congratulations on 10, 10 years for you guys at green juju well, that would be a big congratulations to Kelly. She's the one who started it and who, you know, I, I've been there just on, you know, just under three years. So, Gosh, um, well, maybe, maybe two and a half years, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tremendous thing. I think that's a real turning point for a company in the, in the industry we're in. So excited. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So y'all remember Billy has no idea what we're talking about. So <laughs> 
let's tell him. Oh, he's brave <laughs> like that. Mm -hmm. I get it, no it, different. It helps you think on your feet. That's what I. That's why I always tell people: don't tell me the questions. Uh, you know, and I think it, it keeps it more real. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's no different than people that bring us questions. Pam, you're going to start mm -hmm. us off. Please. Well, I can. I wanted to, I, I think we wanted to talk about just diving into the ing ingredients in pet food uh, for our, for those pet parents out there who are maybe just starting out and just trying to learn what all, what is all the brouhaha over ingredients and why do we get so um, passionate about what we're feeding our, our cats and dogs? Because there's obviously a difference between ultra processed and fresh and there's a wide gap there and there's also so many differences between you know health outcomes and even behavior outcomes based on what you're feeding so where should we start ladies right there <laughs> quality yeah okay quality talk let's talk that. about quality yeah sure so, i mean I, I would say, you know, one of the things sort of starting out is one of the, I guess, like, uh, I don't want to say privileges that I get is to go to AFCO meetings. Um, I maybe the opposite of that word is, is, is what it actually is. But you learn very quickly that it's not just specifically on, it's not exactly what people think it is in both directions. It's not exactly a super regulated world that the that the pet parent who doesn't hasn't done any research doesn't that, that they think it is if it's on the shelf it's safe it's you know it's um complete and balanced etc and it's also not exactly like the unregulated wild west maybe like like you would get from you know our community it's kind of actually somewhere a little bit darker than that which is it's regulated to help people put in ingredients that are not great so it's it's not just unregulated. It's the people who are making the rules, the the AFCO committees. They're so you, and it's important to note that AFCO has no regulatory power. That AFCO then report they make suggestions and then states put it into law. But most states are AFCO states, so you have to basically make everything AFCO compliant, or else you know a company like Green Juju um, can't do different packaging for different States. I mean, it's just not feasible. So then we have to kind of conform to all of those, uh, things. And the people on those committees are FDA state department of agriculture, uh, employees and lobbyists and the lobbyists have a lot of power there. So if you're on the renderer lobbyist, uh, lobby, you're going to make sure that they're, that you, people vote in a way where you don't have to separate out the bad things before you render or whatever that might, you know, entail. And, or if you're a giant corporation, like, you know, Pet Food International, which is, you know, Purina and, and Mars and that, and that side of things, um, you're, you don't want to use higher quality ingredients because it's going to cut into your bottom line. And so you're going to want to keep that regulatory sort of advantageous to you and not advantageous to companies like Green Juju. I would say we have more trouble than, those companies dealing with regulation and state, you know, state, state, uh, ag people and stuff like that. So, so when you say yeah, something no, like no, no, no. not oh, Janet, okay. It would help if we could hear each other. Um, <laughs> and when you say something like not take out the bad things before rendering, what do you mean by bad things? Well, just the things that you have uh, heard about in pet food, um, like um, animals that didn't die by slaughter, you know, uh, potentially dogs and cats, just just other, you know, and also things that may be associated with all of those animals that are not actually animals. Um, so other debris and things like that that go into those, um, but also quality standards as well. You know, they don't want necessarily um, you know, to be able to tell you to put, uh, to be able to let you put grass fed on the, on the actual ingredient panel, because they don't want to separate those things out from each other. Um, mm -hmm. And so, and that was actually, that's actually a direct reference to something that happened in a meeting and that renderer uh, 
the guy from the renderers association specifically said that specifically said we can't do that and that motion died like immediately so um wow yeah, yeah. okay yeah. so for the purposes of our listeners who you know we pet parent 2.0 maybe but you know some people that are um listening that are just starting out on the journey they may not be familiar with afco or um, rendering, and I know we've talked amongst ourselves, especially in the industry, about like 4D meets. Could you touch on kind of like I've heard people say in our industry, in the retail side where I am, it's AFCO approved. And if I'm not mistaken, there's no such thing as an AFCO approval. And so it gives this sense of false um, security, if you will, to a pet mm -hmm. parent that's hearing um, someone say, oh, that's AFCO approved. And so, you know, there's so much misinformation and misleading information. And that's with, you know, our podcast, we're trying to bring truth um, as, you know, those that we are aligned with, our colleagues, like you guys, we're trying to bring that information to the pet parent. Um, so could you back up just real quick and talk about like what you're saying about the AFCO meeting and the rendering? And I don't know that everybody knows what that is. Well, so AFCO does not approve any foods. That is a very big misconception. And I think people want that to be true so they can have some level of kind of assurance there, but they just make the recommendations. It's mm -hmm. actually completely dependent on the states and what they States don't approve foods, but but they judge whether or not your labels are uh, within their state laws, which are norm, which are AFCO for most states. So there really is no um, big assurance piece on that. Um, so it really does come down to actually trusting the company, trusting the people behind the company, or else you really just don't know what you're getting. Rendering is taking meat, a bunch of meat and carcasses and and things like that, and basically subjecting it to such high temperatures that um, you sort of take all the moisture out of it and it becomes like a meat product. Um, and that I, th I think also for like, for the, for the average person just looking at food, um, the number one thing you're going to see, which even in its best case scenario, isn't great is something like say chicken meal, right? I've mm -hmm. been there, you know, I'm, I, I'm old enough now. So where I can, you know, see the different, um, changes in the industry. Cause it, I remember it, there was a time when it was like, you want chicken to be the number one ingredient. And then it changed to, you want chicken meal to be the number one ingredient because it's actually better because it's like a higher concentration of protein. And then, and now it's sort of shifted back to, and that was really like industry, you know, pushed. Um, but that's another thing too, uh, that you can avoid pretty easily just by looking at it. And that meal is essentially meat that's been cooked down to a powder. So you can imagine if you have meat that's been cooked down to a powder, what's actually left over from a nutrient standpoint, and then you put it into a dough and cook it again at extremely high temperatures. And then, it, so you, you don't really have much left um, beyond just the basic, you know, proteins. Um, and so I think that's probably a little bit more common for the people you're dealing with, because when you get into like the 4D meats and things like that, animals that have died, you know, from disease and in the, in the field and things, that's more along the lines of um, like if you're, you know, buying your food at Walmart or Target or something like that. Um, but, uh, oh, yeah, the other thing I was going to mention, too, though. What's that? In regards to quality. Yeah, I think if you're if you're buying food, yes. I should say I shouldn't talk. I shouldn't talk bad about Target. That is my favorite. Pl that's my social life, and my Target and Whole Foods are my favorite places to go. So um, every Friday night, that's where we go, and it, it's it's amazing. But um, uh, just quick side note: um, I was taking my daughter Maple through Whole Foods. Uh, on, this weekend and in the cart and she looked at me and she's like there's way more samples at costco so <laughs> she has been conditioned to um she's not as bougie as me apparently um but Out of the mouth, babes. 
So, um, but you're still kind of running into those things. So, you know, I, I encourage people always to feed as best as they possibly can and then make whatever adjustments you can as well. Um, mm -hmm. And most people, regardless of budget, can do a lot more, I think, than they think. Than they think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So essentially, AFCO, I almost said ASCO. <laughs> you actually did. <laughs> That little Freudian <laughs> slip. Um, <laughs> no, but realistically, I mean, if you look at it from the from our perspective, looking in, AFCO sets like the lowest quality requirements so that your pet will not die. It doesn't mean that your pet will thrive, right? I mean, it's they're they're not setting a high bar for quality ingredients and standards. They're just saying, hey, we want to be able to throw in all this leftover garbage meat from restaurants and from roadkill and from pastured animals who died and you know you god die. knows what else they're scraping off the road you know what i mean and they're just like oh it's okay to put that in there it's okay to put that in there and now oh, the plastic wrap it's okay to put that in there you know they're just i just don't think they have high standards for various reasons and obviously their lobbyists have a have a big say so in in that like you were describing yeah, I, I would say two things on that. Number one, that's absolutely true in terms of like the quality standard that they're looking to do. Um, mm -hmm. They actually say, I've heard the FDA give a presentation about what they call recycling. So I would actually say the, the entire reason the pet food industry exists outside of this sort of newer holistic movement is to recycle waste from other industries somewhere besides a landfill. And that's not yeah. me speculating that. They, li they literally said that during this presentation. Um, and said, if it doesn't go into pet food, it's going to go into landfills and, you know, ruin the earth. Um, and to which I always say, my dog is not a landfill. And, right. but the other thing is this, I think people get confused when it comes to the standards of, um, uh, quality versus like nutrient standards. So one of the misconceptions I see a lot is people say like the AFCO complete and balanced standards are super, super low and everything. And so you'll see her, here come some companies say, oh, well, we far exceed all those. Well, some of them you do, wouldn't want to far exceed it. Some mm. of it you'd want to be right around where that is. If you look at our food, exa if, exactly. Our vitamin D levels are where they need to be, but they're not exponentially high or anything like that. Not, not to say there would be a problem if they were higher than they are because they're in whole food form. Um, however, that is a misconception in the holistic world. Um, but and And that leads to sort of a, a further point, which is that there's actually two AFCO profiles for cats because canned food was so prevalent for so long, but there's only one for dogs, and that's for kibble. And so when we make foods that are either frozen raw or freeze dried raw or whatever, we have to make it to that nutrient profile, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, so we're all just trying to, I think, really do the best we can. Um, Mm -hmm. on that. And and this is my shameless plug, but we we sent out an email to retailers today uh announcing, you know, that our um food is our frozen food is coming in March and it's going to be um not to Texas, but thank you. <laughs> it'll be it'll be there in 2026 for Texas. You 20, you'll be all good. That's that's about <laughs> what I was anticipating for Texas. Um Just, that yeah, actually brings up a really good point list that already well, now you don't have to. Um, <laughs> so that brings up a really good point, and we don't we can talk about this a little bit later. Um, but you brought up the vitamin D and how yours is in whole food form. So talking about the difference in whole food nutrition versus synthetic nutrients is something I do want to touch on. But do you ladies have other questions first? No, I'm good. I do. It goes back to I think what about all the um, ones you emailed me or texted dinner. me. Well, about well, you both. They all relate to what you were saying. They both relate to what um, Pam and Billy both have said so far. When you talk about ingredients and you, nutritional profiles and nutritionally, um, I don't want to say nutritionally sound, but just being bio bioavailable, kibble versus fresh whether that's gently cooked, whether it's frozen raw, freeze-dried raw, I think there's a there's a lot more education 
that needs to be done in the industry for pet parents about what's all the the big deal about I feed kibble? Big deal. You know, it's been on the market for decades and my dog is fine. Why do you, you know, I don't give them quote unquote table scraps. We hear that every once in a while Mm -hmm. um, in the retail store. And, you know, I'm trying to, together with my team to rephrase that and say, Hey, you know, broccoli and Brussels sprouts and asparagus and greens are excellent for your pet. And um, so is whole food, you know, whole meat. So before we move on to like vitamin D and whatnot, if you could touch on y'all's yours and green jujus and your experience with your previous you know places of employment whole food versus what's in a bag of it's a great way to phrase that (laughs) Um, (laughs) yeah totally um yeah no i uh there's a couple things on that point number one i think the idea that we're gonna all you know formulate all of our dogs diets, uh, completely is ridiculous. Um, the, the, the information's just not there. Um, the tab, the lab test data is just not there. The idea that you can take a recipe and formulate something and you've got my dog's going to have this amount of manganese every time I do this recipe from these whole foods is just untrue. Um, if there's so much variance in it, and especially when it comes to meat products, you know, depending on what they were raised or, you know, raw milk or, you know, eggs or anything like that. And, and also, you know, I I feel like there's not going to be an issue with uh, deficiencies like people think there's going to be, you know, there's, there's a reason I'm not a part of any sort of Facebook groups and things like that. It's because, you know, everyone has the answer for what your diet's what your dog's diet should be, your dog or cat, but you know best. And when I look at my dog's current diet, right, I feed our freeze-dried food and his almost almost every day his base diet is our freeze-dried food and egg yolk and a, and a sardine from a can. And mm-hmm. I look at that sardine and that egg and I view it as the exact same thing as our food from a completeness standpoint. Is it AFCO yeah. complete? No. Is milk AFCO complete? No, but it's actually more complete even though it doesn't meet those requirements. So I do think let's just do the best we can. Uh, Whatever your brain does to like, I need to know this or I don't need to know this. Um, So me specifically, Huckleberry, uh, my French Bulldog gets three sources of food. He gets me in the morning and evening for his breakfast and dinner, which is widely known as my favorite time of the day. Uh, Getting up and drinking coffee and feeding the dog is my favorite thing to do. Um, and then he also gets food when we cook dinner. Most of our meals are had at home and Emily is famously not good at keeping things on the counter when she's cutting them, et cetera. And those, those, those plant foods, I'll walk in and give him some meat before it's cooked, all that stuff. That's part of his rounded out nutrition. And then number three is my darling daughter loves to give him things all the time and it is the cutest (laughs) thing in the world and even if it's not something that he you know is 100 percent what i would give him i still can't say no to her when it comes to basically anything and so you know that's part of it and that builds their bond as well so i'm happy to do that the only thing i told her was no bread Uh, but aside Mm -hmm. from that uh she does give him a lot luckily you know she's a weirdo like me and eats like sardines and stuff all the time so like it's all you know part of his diet anyway. But even if your customers just started to feed some of their food at home and moved Mm -hmm. up to a higher quality kibble, they'd be in such a better position than they are now. Um, Thank you. Not everyone has to. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's, it's never all or nothing. And actually that's my favorite green juju customer is the one that decides they want to do one thing. And that one thing is going to be, they're going to add our raw milk or they're going to add our just greens. Um, Mm -hmm. If we can affect those people and we can get this more on a mainstream side, then we'll have done our jobs. Yeah, that's great. That was one of my questions was, um, and, and you answered it without knowing, but it's just, if we can just add one whole food, you know, to the bowl, it's already a big improvement. And um, my dogs love the 
the greens, just greens. I we have the freeze dry or the dehydrated as well as the frozen. But um, they love it. They finished off their second container already for January. I've got to get another one. <laughs> Just this morning, I thought. Well, it away. it's 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 a highly underestimated uh, part of a dog's diet. It's it's particularly important for my dog's diet, um, mm -hmm. and just across the board, we're finding out now that dogs and and regardless of what they're fed, it doesn't matter if it's frozen raw, it doesn't matter if it's kibble, need more fiber. I mean, people need more fiber too, but dogs need more fiber. Um, yeah. And they need more plant antioxidants. They need more of that mineral content that comes from plants. We just need to do plants for the right things, which are those things. We don't need plants for protein and fat and things like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's so much more important. And actually for my own dog, that is, that is one of the um, things that I, if I take that out of his diet, um, he's a completely different dog digestively. So that's actually, honestly, arguably the most important part of his diet. That's interesting. Okay. Thank you. It's great. I think the same goes for cats. Cats do not get enough fiber or diversity, you know, and just because they're carnivores doesn't mean that they don't need fiber. <laughs> it's just, it just doesn't work like that. If we want their gut healthy, you know, we've got to provide a source of food for that, that gut for us. So like my cats eat the raw food and thankfully the recipes come with a source of fiber, but I will play with adding, you know, like today I put just a little bit of pumpkin, just cook pumpkin on their plate to see what they would do with it. And just to help create some diversity. So I don't want people to be afraid to add a plant source or spices you know, something like that that mm -hmm. has a nutritional component to it doesn't mean that you need to make them a, you know, 50% of their diet vegetarian because it's not going to work for a cat, but they still need some kind of source of fiber. A hundred percent. I would agree with that. What did they do with the pumpkin? They ate did it. They, eat it? they did. Mm -hmm. I mixed it with the green juju goat's milk. <laughs> okay, that helps. That's the key right there. Well, here, here's my question for you. Do you guys have the cartons yet? Yes, Jamie we finally does. got them. I have. I okay, have good. One. Yeah, That's crazy that it took that long, to be honest with you. I, I was actually That's talking crazy. to, um, just side note on that, I was talking to uh, Sam, who is our um, guy who runs the, the board for our milk farmers, because they um, sort of made it themselves into a little co-op. Aww. And he, it, he's just an, an amazing person. He's an Amish guy who's like, I'm good at Excel if you need to need me to do that at any point. So he's a funny guy, but he, um, I was just telling him today about how long it took the cartons to get into Texas. So <laughs> he's like, really? Um, so I'm glad you guys have those in because they're the most adorable cartons in the freezer. Yeah, mm, they are. That I can't was wait what, like three weeks ago? Uh, two weeks, two weeks ago, ago. It? it was right was right it? around two the holidays so yeah th maybe three yeah yeah and i want you guys to know um i know this podcast goes out to non-texans but i i do want you to know that um we hired um a guy named antoine who's our vp of business development and he's amazing and we are having him very connected with our distributors uh moving forward and so we're working very hard to not have that be a problem in the future. So our goal here is for when we announce the food in March for you guys to have it at exactly the same time. And I think we're going to hit that. So um, you can be mad at me if it doesn't happen. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'm afraid to, to uh, okay, pull the trigger and announce it. <laughs> right? I know. I yeah. know I have clients that are like, please tell me when it gets here. And I'm like, I... <laughs> We'll see. Just yep. know that we'll we're see. we're in touch with Green Juju, Jessica. <laughs> so <laughs> as soon as we have it, we will let Excellent. you know. <laughs> well, awesome. Okay. Well, let's go back to the ingredient labels. Um, when a, a pet parent is looking at an ingredient label, and maybe we can bring in the synthetics here, we obviously want to see as many whole food sources as possible. We know that, but when we're looking at an ingredient label and we see more than more than half of the ingredients are words that we can't pronounce, what is 
what is your reaction to that? Well, I mean, they're just, it's the same reason why you want to get your vitamins from food as opposed to, you know, a uh, multivitamin that's not food-based or something like that. It's just synthetic vitamins are just part of a vitamin and your mm -hmm. body is just not interpreting it the same as, you know, if you eat absorbic acid is not the same thing as eating an orange. Um, okay. And so, you know, but part of, but part of that, um, it wouldn't be a pod, dog podcast if there wasn't some barking. Um, but part of that is um, that companies trying to meet that AFCO profile and mm. they have mm. sourced a certain way. This is the ingredients they can get. So they have to add X, Y, and Z. But, but the other part of that too, um, which people don't consider a lot of the time is that the AF, for instance, the AFCO profile was made a really long time ago and it's made using uh, high grain or legume ingredients. Um, and that's how they formulated out that, um, that profile. And so the problem with that is those, those ingredients have something called phytic acid, which is an anti-nutrient that stops your body from absorbing minerals or your dog's body from, or a cat's body from its absorbing minerals. And so what happens is, um, you need to add extra of those minerals because they they've sort of formulated for that phytic acid. But now if you have a raw food that has none of that phytic acid, essentially, um, mm -hmm. you st they still want you to formulate to that, even though it could now be at, you know, potentially toxic levels because of the fact that um, there's nothing stopping the body from absorbing that. So that's, that's where these uh, synthetic vitamins and minerals come into come into play. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to tell you, you can reach those um, profiles without them. It just depends on, you know, being creative, uh, number one, and also um, sourcing correctly. And that's, that's one of the other things too. If you're looking at a label and you have questions, you should reach out to the company. And if you don't get a response, then that's a, that's a pretty red flag. Yeah. hundred percent. It would be mm -hmm. nice if AFCO would like bring their standards up to date, their formulation, you know, not that they will, but it would be. No, it, but their goal isn't to make really great pet food. Their goal is to recycle these yeah. crops and things into yeah. food. And, and as long they're interested in safety, as long as it's not essentially, as long as it's not poisonous. Um, that doesn't mean it's good for them over time. And doesn't mean it's not poisonous, you know, for those mm -hmm. listening, I'm doing air quotes, poisonous over time, you know, um, it just means that it's safe in that moment. The other thing people should know too, is AFCO also regulates the feed of the animals that you may eat and mm -hmm. also that you may, you know, drink the milk of or, or butter or, or anything like that. And it's just yeah. as bad or maybe even worse yeah. on on that. And so, um, sorry, I don't, I think we veered off from the, uh, the synthetic ingredients, but you, some, you know, you'll get some synthetic ingredients. And, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to berate people and be like, you can't do any of this, but just try to do as little as possible and try to vary up your dog or cat's diet and you'll be fine. On, on that yeah. note about the synthetic vitamin you know like mix in i just did air quotes to pet health junkies um the mix in the vitamin mix so you know in our store we have a very curated kibble room kibble dry food room and we have a brand that is 100 percent whole food and then they use um probiotics and that's it there's not one synthetic vitamin in it then you can go look at the next rack and you'll have we have a food that has great longevity, great history, um, and have a big following, you know, for dry food feeders. They have synthetic vitamins that have had to have been added in. Can you talk about how one and I know there are more on the market that are considered dry food that are hundred percent whole ingredients versus the majority that have to have a synthetic um, vitamin pack. Can you talk about how one company can avoid the vitamin pack while the others can't? Why? Yeah, it's just, it's just, 
sourcing? There's a couple of things. Uh, number one, it's, it's sourcing. Uh, number two, but most of it's just formulation itself. So mm. I'm guessing that the second company with the synthetic vitamins has particular sourcing. This is what they can get. This is what's cost effective. This is, and then they, they for basically, um, uh, if you're looking for like a regulatory cheat code, it's synthetic vitamins. Cause as long as you're hitting like a certain protein and, and fat and fiber, um, level, you can put the synthetic vitamins in and really formulate to whatever you want, right? Like I could make a dehydrated or I could make a freeze dried food that's just muscle meat, bone, and then a bunch of synthetic vitamins. And that would be AFCO complete. But why would we want to do that? Instead of that, we were more creative and did something different. So that's really it. And and I'm guessing this the second one too is probably using um, like meat meal, like I was talking about, like chicken meal or something like that. And that also cooks out a lot of the nutrients. And so the more you take out, the more you have to add back in. So the ones that don't are either adding like whole food concentrates or they're just using, um, and I probably, yeah, in my head, I'm thinking I know what the, the first one is, but um, the first one is probably using um, just more, unprocessed ingredients like if if a if a dry food company is using say eggs and uh fresh meat and and it's still going through a processing thing but it's not two processing things right it's like the difference between i have a little um i have a like a automatic um espresso machine at home that like you know steams the milk and stuff like that so when i want I, i'm mostly a black coffee drinker but when i want to have that right? I can take my raw milk and put it into this thing and make like a latte. Is the milk raw anymore? No, but at least it didn't go through two steps, right? It didn't get pasteurized yeah. the first time and go through the second one. Yeah. So it'd be kind of the same thing. You're getting less processing on the front end. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm guessing that that's how, what the case is. Less processing and more of the initials least sourced ingredients. Yeah, I mean, even in, you know, even in your own diet, it just depends on, I mean, the difference between eating a confined egg on average is, you know, per egg is 6% of your RDA as a human for vitamin D. The average in a pasture-raised egg is 36%. So if I eat three eggs in the morning, that's about 100% of my vitamin D um, in one meal. And so there's a huge difference between those two things. And, and also that goes back to processing as well. Um, we know in, for instance, freeze dried that you're retaining almost all of those uh, nutrients, but obviously when you're doing really high heat cooking, you are not retaining those, a lot of those uh, nutrients. And so it's a big difference here. Yeah. So for our dry food. And talk about eaters. the bio. <laughs> yeah. Add, and talk about the bioavailability. Dried. So the bioavailability is just, I mean, uh, it really just depends on the type of food you're feeding. I mean, if you look at, um, uh, that was one of the things we did when we did our, um, our HPP video, um, and sort of what we, what, the misinformation, information, that kind of thing. And we looked at, um, HPP mm -hmm. frozen foods versus, uh, you know, frozen foods and the digestibility was exactly the same. And so you get the same digestibility during freeze dried. I was actually at a conference in Nebraska workshop for HPP and um, freeze drying. We went through some facilities and we, we actually went through a facility that does like a bunch of formulations. A lot of companies don't even formulate their own foods. Um, to me, that's the funnest part. Um, I'll never lose when I get to go to a store and I see a product that I made, it's the coolest feeling, I think. Um, <laughs> so a lot of people don't formulate their own foods. They actually go to these kind of like large facilities that, well, hey, we'll make it. Whatever you want, we'll we'll figure it out. We'll make it for you. But we were getting the tour through and the guy who ran that facility was talking and he was basically, you know, um, verified what I was talking about, which is when they do test data, they don't have to change anything between freeze dried foods and frozen foods because it doesn't, the, nothing happens to the nutrients essentially. So you can do those formulas exactly the same, um, yeah. which is, you know, really the same results that, that we've seen as well. Um, 
And so it is important, obviously, that you want to rehydrate those foods. Um, however, um, so bioavailability is just kind of across the board. But I also want to, you know, for the people who are, you know, totally against um, something like HPP, bioavailability changes in any step of the process. So, you know, when you're considering what hurdle safety steps your raw food company takes, whether it's, uh, you know, ozone, whether it's keeping the room where the processing is at, at, you know, below 40 degrees or whatever they're doing, all of those steps um, do something to the food, including freezing, right? And exposing it to air and, and all those things. There is nothing that is like a rabbit running through your yard and then your dog or cat catches it and eats it on the spot. There is nothing you can get that is going to be that. And so all of these steps, you just kind of have to pick your poison. They all they all do something small to the food. And just mm. on that HPP point, HPP isn't, I would argue, is, is no less uh, threatening to the food than uh, freezing it refreezing it and then cutting it or, or something like that, you know, they're, they're all going to do something slight. Um, and those are the things that we shouldn't spend a ton of time worrying about that. We should just, again, do the best we can. And, and, um, that's all you can do. Before we go on to the next question, yep. explain to the pet health junkies, which HPP is. So that's high pressure processing or high pressure pasteurization, depending on uh, who you talk to, or or I've seen both terms be used interchangeably. So it's essentially adding pressure instead of, um, uh, so sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Oh, it's adding pressure to food. Um, so you're not heat processing the food, you are making it safer through um, pressure. So they, the, what they're looking for, what you're looking for in a food safety protocol is a way to reduce some, sorry, I don't know if it's loud behind me or not, but um, is a it? A little, but not bad. It's not bad. Oh, sorry about that. This is, I, I, I got this conference room in the co-working space. There's just happens to be a little party going on behind me for some reason. It looks fun. Um, <laughs> so that's good. Yeah. Um, so I'll just I'll HPP just keep trucking through. Hopefully you're okay. Yeah. yeah. So what essentially you want to reduce the salmon the, the salmonella, the, the E. coli and listeria. And HPP right. is really, really good at specifically reducing those um, to what's called five log, which is a certain r reduction of bacteria. And actually freeze drying is a reduction step as well um, for mm -hmm. those things. But we know that uh, background bacteria does survive. Um, that um, we know that through uh, studies done by a probiotic company that when they added their probiotic mixture that that was also a log reducer to the food and then HPP did that they survived. So we do know that that that's happening. But that's actually a common misconception as well. If you have a, you know, the the number one thing I hear about that type of processing is well, it kills the good bacteria. Well, there's really no good bacteria in meat. There's no real probiotic bacteria in meat. There's actually just sort of background yeah. flora, um, but nothing you would define as a probiotic. Yeah. Um, and so that's kind of what that is. Most people do it, and it's not it's not really anything to worry about. We did a lot of research, you know, when we stepped into that arena and. You know, I was on the opposite end of that. In fact, most of the points you hear that are bad about HPP came from me specifically. And now I've sort of changed on that. And I changed because of the data that I saw. And that's what we call science. If you get yeah. new data and you don't want and you don't want to see that data because it doesn't fit your narrative, then you're just not practicing science. And so um, that's kind of where I where I came out on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. There we go. I think the party's calmed down, so we're we're good to go. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. There's a lady <laughs> behind you going. <laughs> um, so I think uh, we've talked a lot about dry foods as far as ingredients and having not so wonderful ingredients. And I remember talking to Susan Thixton a while back, and she. Um, pointed out that it is important to check all ingredient labels because there certainly are raw foods on the market that are also partaking in these practices of 
waste recycling and not using really high quality ingredients. So um, again, I just think it's really important to reiterate that regardless of what product you're looking at, whether it's on a shelf or in a freezer, to check the ingredient label. And if you feel like calling the company, call the company and get all of your questions answered and be comfortable with, with what's on that ingredient label. Um, yeah. I mean, so I can tell you right now, if you, <laughs> if you reach out to Green Juju with a nutrition question, I answer every single one. So uh, if you want to talk, to, you know, if you want to get the answers, you're going to get it from someone who actually, you know, makes the products. Um, and not to say that you have to be able to do that at every company. Um, but I do think it's important that they have someone that, you know, will talk to you about those nuances. Um, so um, always, yeah, I would say, and the other thing too, is a lot of times, you know, companies change all the time and they get investors and, and things happen and things just change. So even if you're happy with a brand for a lot of years, and this goes for us as well, um, always hold our feet to the fire as well. But even if you're happy with a brand for a year or two, keep, you know, look at the label. So something may have changed, something may have not, but it goes further than that. You even have to trust it further than that. And I say that because, I mean, what do people think is holding companies back from not even putting in the food what's on the label? And it's not like there's someone at the plant that from regulatory looking at what's going into the batches. So for me, you truly do have to trust, you know, the people making it. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, when, when uh, Green Juju makes products, me and Kelly do a live with it and we show you like, this is why we did it. This is why we wanted to do it. This is what we're doing. So you can actually see that there's humans behind it who care about their own animals that care about your animals um, rather than just like a picture of a farm on a website, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, can happen. So, um, so that's my but soapbox. pretty pictures. Yeah, that's true. I get. To, I work with some very beautiful farms here in Pennsylvania, and we do put those pictures up. But, um, um, and I will say, as a side note as well, I'm excited because me and Sam were on our phone call today. We're also planning our uh, two day of all of my goat farm inspections, which will happen in the early spring. So I get to go to every one of our 15 goat farms and inspect all of that, and meet our family farmers and. He was saying today that um, we've made such a huge difference in their community for supporting their families. And so we got about 15 farms and Amish people have a lot of children. And so you're supporting those families. Um, they give most of their milk uh, to Green Juju. And so um, it's a really cool thing to be a part of, in, in my opinion. Absolutely. That's a beautiful thing. I think that's one... <laughs> no, I, uh, most of them can't be on camera cause they're Amish, but <laughs> cultural differences. Yeah. I, I think it's important for people to keep in mind where like the sourcing of the, the ingredients that their pet food company is using and see if that aligns with them as, you know, in their personal value system, um, I think a lot of people would be surprised in like not a good way to find when they realize where some of their pet food ingredients are coming from that their dogs and cats are actually eating. I yeah. Know. I mean, it just, it, it, this is truly an outpouring of Kelly and I's value system and, and the fact that we um, do this in our own lives. I mean, you know, when it comes to me, I, here in Pennsylvania, I live in like the 1860s. Uh, I say that because, you know, uh, I sort of do double duty when I go to our the production facility we work with here. Because when I'm going up there, I'm going to my cheesemaker and I'm going to my butter guy. And, you know, my, my cheesemaker raised our family pig this year and our butter guy processed it. And now he's mm -hmm. going to raise, you know, chickens for me on pasture and process those out. And so... Um, it goes back to that's how we eat as a family. We go like, oh, here, we just have this whole pig and now we're going to eat that until it's gone. And then we're going to move on to the next thing. So um, I try to do as much as I can as sort of an outpouring into um, 
what we do at Green Juju, and I would never use anything that I'm not comfortable with. And basically, like human grade is a good standard, like, oh, this food would be in a grocery store, but that's not good enough for what we do. Um, you can't, you'd have to go to like a co-op or Whole Foods or something to find what we have. In fact, if you take a product like Bam's Beets, um, the purple cabbage comes from the Lancaster Farm Fresh Co-op here. And if you go to my local Whole Foods and go to the purple cabbage, it's exactly the same one. So that's the sort of thing that you want in your food versus um, say, you know, although I will say this, we do do uh, one ugly food. Uh, and what I mean by ugly food is we get the turmeric that's too ugly for Whole Foods. So it's actually the same turmeric. It's just not pleasing to the eye. So we get that. And I do like that because that food should be used. And it's exactly the same nutritionally. It's just, you know, a little bit homely. You're just recycling in a way. Like you were talking about earlier. It has in a good go way, somewhere. yes. In a good way. good way. Yes, for sure. Yeah. That's cool. Jessica, did we miss anything or did we kind of cover our list? Kim is not I, happy right now. I do know Kim, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to mute myself when she <laughs> decides to go crazy. Um, yeah, no, I think we're good. And I, I think, think to be respectful of Billy's time, do you, if do you, you guys have any other questions to. We covered our list. No, I, I think just, we covered a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate your time, Billy, okay, and good. the work that you guys yeah, do together you. at Green Juju. I'm proud to have you guys in the, in the store and to feed it to my own pets. Me too. <laughs> well, we appreciate your trust. It means a lot that, you know, you guys and, and people want to, um, to trust us with your pet's nutrition. And I will say to the, you know, to the, so not only you guys, but also all of the independent retailers out there, you're really the lifeblood of what we do. We're just a small company of a couple people and we put out our products, but it truly is you guys who actually have the relationship with the um, customers and you're actually advocating um, for us. And you know that, you know, the dogs, you know, the cats. Um, and it, it's such an a hugely um, important part of the process to getting what we do out to um, cause you take weird, some of the, you know, uh, Kelly has often said that she has to give me weird projects every once in a while to keep me interested. Um, and so when you, when you release products like that, it takes talking to people about it, you know? And yeah. so we genuinely appreciate that and are happy to be, um, I'm happy we're in Texas cause I get to go there sometimes and then I eat barbecue every night. So <laughs> it's a good, good deal for me. <laughs> There's plenty to go around. Barbecue every night. <laughs> when, when? Yeah. Five straight <laughs> nights the last time I was there. I, I That is not an exaggeration. So. <laughs> so Awesome. Well, Texans know how to barbecue. That's for sure. Yep. And you can even eat barbecue for <laughs> breakfast, for Billy, if you didn't know that. You, you can. No. I, you that can would get me. That would get me out of my routine for my raw milk, but uh, um. but dinner for sure. <laughs> I know. Well, you can well, even get barbecue again. at like the the gas stations and the there. Yep. It's just everywhere. It's probably it's like some of the pork. best stuff out there, to be honest. We yep. ha we have a lack of pork barbecue here, though. Oh, that's, that's like North because, Carolina or something, right? It's a it's a North yeah, that's a North Carolina mm. thing. I, I say that because I was that. no, I was in Alabama recently and had barbecue as well. So it's a it's a theme with me apparently. Northern. <laughs> yep, that's awesome. Okay, thank you so much for joining us, Billy, and yes, thank you, thank you. and Janet, and um, yeah. Until next we'll time. Just, Sound, yeah, yeah absolutely. I'll, Sounds I'll good. It's record my stuff. It's absolutely my pleasure, and hopefully you guys have a good uh, evening. Yeah. We will. Y'all too. You. All right. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye.